So in this uh, lecture, we're going to cover the very useful tool, which is called principal component analysis. Also, it's a tool which we use for pattern recognition. So why are we going to do this in in the context of food science? Well, we can think of that we want to characterize a certain type of food. That could be a coffee sample, for instance. And when we taste it, there are certain characteristics about it. The, the coffee could be bitter, it could be sweet, it could be sour, and so forth. And it's all that all these characteristics that sums up to how we perceive the coffee. So that is a multivariate problem and not something which we can capture by just univariate statistics. So that's why we're going to deal a little with pattern recognition by PCA. So if we look to what the task of a data analytical scientist is, it is to understand data, take it, understand it, process it and extract value from it, visualize it and communicate it. And PCA is exactly a tool that does all of these different things and that is why it's so powerful for analyzing data. So what is multivariate? So here we have three phases but what we are given is only the nodes from the three phases. So what we see is that it's hard to recognize which phase these noses belong to. It is known persons, at least from a Danish perspective. If we add a little more than one feature, so now we have three features, so the nose, the mouth, and the, and the cheek, we will see that we have a better chance of telling who these persons are. So I would suspect that this is Barack Obama, and this is a Danish politician, and this guy I don't really know. Anyway, which is what is difficult with one feature becomes more easy with three features. But when we are given all the features of the face, it will be easy to recognize that we have um, an American politician, a Danish politician, and a soccer player. Okay, if we try to say, well, multivariate, that is, seems like a good idea, but it's, it's too hard to handle, then we will say, well, then give me a univariate a single number which I can use to characterize whatever I'm looking at. And if I want to characterize nuts, I could say, well, that's a simple thing. I can take the diameter and I can use that to characterize nuts. And then I will say, well, in my factory, I will have these three types of nuts. I'll have the ones which are too small, so they don't work. The ones which are too big, they don't work. And everything in the middle here will work and they are perfect nuts. If I take something which is a little bit more complicated than just nuts, for instance, humans, and say, well, I want to do the exact same exercise. I want to take a univariate measure and then characterize humans. For instance, I could take height. That's a perfectly valid measure for characterizing a human, but is it sufficient? Then we do the same stuff here. We say, well, everything below here, that's not humans. Everything above here, that's not humans. And everything in the middle here is humans. But this... But this exercise is limited because we can find any animal which have exactly the same height as a human here in the middle. And based on the height alone, we will not be able to distinguish these two species. So when we have stuff which are just slightly more complicated than nuts, we, meet, we need to characterize it by more than just one measure. And there we need something which is multivariate. So here's another example where we try to use a univariate measure, the height of man and monkeys to separate the two. And what we see is that it's hard to separate the two just based on height. There will be, there's a tendency that men are higher than monkeys, but there's still some men which are lower than the highest monkeys. If you do the same for weight, say, well, height didn't work, then let's try another one. Let's try weight. We'll see that we find exactly the same pattern. There's a tendency to the men being a little more heavier than the monkeys, but then again, it's not totally well separated. We have these two variables and we can see that none of them alone is enough. This is just a stupid example of separating man and monkey, but this could be more serious in terms of separating disease, non-disease, different types of diet and so forth. Okay, so we have these two measures, but can we in any way combine the two to get a more clear picture than what we get by interpreting each one alone? So what we do is we make a scatter plot of these two versus each other. So this is weight versus height, and this is for the first sample. We do that for all the points, and what we see is that we find 
a straight line here in the middle where we have a separation between the two species. So we got information from combining the two which was not there when we interpret the two variables alone and independently. Okay, so the learning objectives is that you should know that PCA is a pattern recognition tool, that PCA reveals relations, that is correlations between variables, that PCA extracts, estimates what we call latent structures or components, that we have something called scores, and the scores reflect the samples distribution, or in this case, as it's multivariate, the multivariate distribution of the samples, and the loadings reflect the variables intercorrelation. Then we have, in addition to PCA, we have a, a type, three types of plots which we use to visualize the results, and that is where the tool becomes really powerful. So we have three types of plots. We have the score plot, the loading plot, and the by plot. Okay, so what is PCA? Well, PCA works on a data table, and here's a data table of some countries. So there are different countries down here. And there are some descriptors for these countries. So you could ask some questions based on this table. For instance, which European country is most similar to Japan? And Japan is highlighted here. And then we should just go out in the table and look for numbers which are similar to Japan. Well, that seems a bit hard. At least if we find the first one, Australia here, that seems to match on the first variable. Austria matches Japan on the first variable, but then on the second and especially the third variable, they're pretty much off. So that becomes a hard task. We could also ask the question, which countries are most dissimilar to Malta? And that becomes double hard, because that is both countries which are uh, different above or different below on these variables uh, compared to Malta. Instead of interpreting the table, we make a PCA of this. And what we get out of it is this score plot. And this score plot is the multivariate distribution of the sample. And that might sound fancy, but what it is, is that two samples positioned close to each other are alike. And samples, countries in this case, that are positioned far away from each other are disalike. So if we should answer the question, which country in Europe is most similar to Japan, it would be Netherlands or Belgium and which countries are most dissimilar to Malta, it would be US or India. In addition to the score plot, we also got the loading plot, which tells you which variables are correlated. So they go in, there is three variables out here, which is the gross national product, how many students there are per 100,000 inhabitants, and how many can read at an age above 15 years. So these characteristics seem to go together. So if one is high, we would suspect the other ones also to be pretty high. On the other hand, we have here over here two variables, infant death and the number of inhabitants per physician. They also seem to track together. And what we see that these are positioned just opposite each other in, in terms of 0, 0.0, and which means that we have a negative correlation between this chunk of variables and this chunk of variables. So these five variables in total merely reflects one underlying phenomena, which could, we could call the wealth of the country reflected by these five uh, measures. Down here we have population density in the country reflected as a function of how much agricultural land there is and just the population density. And obviously these two also go together. And what we see is that they are not really connected to the other um, characteristics of the country. So that's the loading plot which tells us how the different variables are correlated. We can take these two plots and chuck them on top of each other and that is called the by plot. So here we have the scores in the background here we can see the different countries and their position and we have the loadings. And so we have here why is Malta positioned up here? Well that is because there is a lot of people chuck into that small island. And we have why US is positioned out here. It's because it has high numbers on these variables while having low numbers on these variables. And India, on the other hand, has high numbers on these not so nice variables and low numbers on these variables. So what we see is that, that we get the distribution of the samples, what is similar, what is dissimilar, and in addition, we get the answer to why. You see here that we have PC1, 
and PC2. So when we talk about principal components, we have this PC1, that's principal component 1, and it reflects 46% of the data variation. Principal component 2 here, orthogonal to principal component 1, is reflecting 26% of the variation um, and is mainly spanned by these two variables. Yeah. So how is this done in R? So returning to the task of wanting to understand why coffee is perceived in different ways, we have an, a data set like this. So we have 312 variables, 312 observations, I'm sorry, and 12 variables. Let's just see what the variables are. Well, we have sample here, so that reflects this sample temperature. Then we have temperature, that's pretty much the same. Then we have the different judges, serving order. And then we have some response variables, some temperature judgment, liking, intensity, and so forth. And then at the end, we have uh, gender, reflected on two variables, male and female. So, if we would like to make a PCA of this, we use the print comp function on the response variables. So the response variables are in this case, maybe temperature judgment, but we let's just take for li from liking. One, two, three, four, five, six, from variable six, variable six, and then up to sweet, which must be variable 10. Then we want to scale this, so we get equal distribution of features and centers. And that's a PCA model. So now I have a PCA model calculated in M. Now we want to visualize this PCA model, and there we use the very nice feature which is called ggbyplot, which takes in a PCA model. And so what we see down here is a biplot, so I have the variables there here reflected by arrows. So we see that we have two variables here which are correlated and we have two variables here which are correlated and something which is not strongly correlated with other things. And then we have all the scores in the background that is reflecting each of the 312 samples. We can decorate this a little. So we know stuff about the samples, for instance, that they are measured at different temperatures. So we put that on top of this one. So here we get a color code for each measurement, which reflects a certain judge at a different temperature. So this sample is from 31 degrees and so forth. It's hard to interpret this one. I cannot see any, at least if I look quickly at it, I cannot see uh, any groupings of the temperature. So what I would like to do is I would like to put a circle around each of the groups, so for each temperature group, I put a circle around centered where the center of the group is. Then we get something like this, and now it becomes more easy to interpret. We see that we have 31 degrees up here, 37 here, and then we have all the high degrees from 40, 40, 4 degrees up to 62 degrees uh, positioned here. Okay, so there seems to be some ordination of the different temperatures in terms of the sensorical attributes. We can further make this plot a little more nice. We can say, well, the names, we can't really look at them because they're too small. So let's make them a little bigger. And then I'm annoyed by the background being gray, so I want it to be white. So this is a pretty nice biplot of the of five descriptors of coffee served for a bunch of different consumers at different temperatures. So what I see is that basically at the low temperatures we do not see high rankings of the temper of the liking or the sweetness or the intensity. Whereas the features like bitter and sour seems to be independent of the temperature gradient in the data. 
What we also see is that we see that at some level of serving temperature above 44 degrees, it becomes pretty hard for the judges or the consumers here to distinguish the different samples because there are not really huge differences between 44 up to 62, although there is a slight uh, gradient here. Yeah.